gastroesophageal uh, reflux disease. An obese male with six, eight week history of history of asthma like symptoms complains of intermittent squeezing, chest pain, especially at night. Remember in cardiology, we talked about chest pain, especially at night, cue you in onto GERD. What would be the histological changes with this pathology? Histological changes for GERD is going to be basal zone hyperplasia, elongation of the lamina propria with scattered neutrophils and eosinophils. And this is the key uh, pathological finding when you're talking about GERD. So what is the pathological term to describe the histological change of this chronic reflux that affects the esophagus? Histological change that affects the, the esophagus especially after long-standing GERD, is going to be metaplasia. And metaplasia is going to be reversible, okay? And so what is the tissue that the esophageal tissue changes to? And that is going to be more of a gastric tissue. And the gastric tissue is going to be this columnar with goblet cells, okay? So because of the GERD, you have the bottom portion of your esophagus, which is non-keratinized squamous epithelium, changes to another normal tissue, i.e. metaplasia, and that is going to be columnar with goblet cells, and that whole pathology is known as Barrett's esophagus, and that's a metaplasia. Now metaplasias can lead to dysplasias and eventually carcinomas, and that's why we key in on Barrett's esophagus so much, is that it can be a precursor to esophageal adenocarcinoma. A patient presents with severe heartburn, telangiectasias, an exam showing multiple ulcers at the distal ends of the fingers. Skin biopsy shows calcifications in the soft tissue on the dorsum of the elbows. What is the likely mechanism behind the heartburn? This is very interesting. Okay, severe heartburn, telangiectasias, multiple ulcers at the distal end of the fingertips. What am I talking about? Well, I am talking to you about Crest syndrome, right? Calcinosis, Raynaud's phenomena, Sclerodactyly, esophageal dysmotility, telangiectasias, okay? And what happens is, is in sclerodactyly, or in uh, Crest syndrome, this is a form of limited scleroderma, and that causes a esophageal dysmotility because of this fibrous replacement of the lower esophageal sphincter, and this can cause secondary GERD. You have the esophageal muscularis that is replaced by fibrosis in a patient who has Crest syndrome. What are other diseases that have telangiectasias? Crest syndrome was one of them. How about this one? A patient with telangiectasia, epistaxis, which is nose bleeding, and GI bleeding, what are we thinking of here? We are thinking about osler weber Rendu, which is a hemorrhagic hereditary telangiectasia syndrome. Okay, so this is how we're integrating these different um, um, findings. How about this one? We talked about osler weber Rendu. What's another Weber pathology that we think of? Well, Sturge Weber, right? Sturge Weber is going to be related to what skin finding? Nevis phlemius, which is this port wine stain and tram tract calcifications. And the port wine stain is usually in the trigeminal distribution. Another good thing for us to key in on is the difference between a sliding hiatal, uh, hiatal hernia and a parasophageal hernia, okay? And the risk factors for GERD are going to include these hiatal hernias. So let's go through the risk factor of GERD. Alcohol, tobacco, obesity, caffeine, and hiatal hernias. And these are the two hiatal hernias um, that we're gonna talk about. Sliding hiatal hernia is when the cardia of the stomach slides into the lower esophagus. So the top portion of the heart slides into the lower esophagus. The x-ray finding is this hourglass appearance of the stomach. And it is related to the mechanism of the GE junction, the gastroesophageal junction, being displaced upwards. Contrast that with the parasophageal hernia. The parasophageal hernia is when the fundus of the stomach protrudes into the thorax. The fundus of the stomach protrudes into the thorax. And thus, you can get bowel sounds in the lower lung fields. And this can cause lung hypoplasia. So remember, the difference between sliding and parasophageal hernias, both of them um, are going to be risk factors for um, having GERD, okay? Esophageal cancer. Patient with weight loss and six month, old, uh, six month difficulty swallowing his food. His wife reports in the past weeks, he has appeared dehydrated. CBC shows low hemoglobin. Anytime you're thinking of these nonspecific symptoms, weight loss, fatigue, low hemoglobin, think about cancer in particular. He has a biopsy which shows neoplastic cells which stain keratin positive. What is a likely contributing factor to his T 
tissue histology. Okay, so that is going to be related to alcohol consumption and smoking, and that's the biopsy of the esophagus in particular. So remember that when we talk about esophageal cancer, it is going to be a progressive dysphagia. What does a progressive dysphagia mean? Is because I had good T, uh, good uh, uh, tendency with liquids, however solids I wasn't able to uh, really tolerate, but eventually what happens is that you can't tolerate liquids and solids, and that's that progressive dysphagia. If this patient had difficulty swallowing food and water at the same time, not progressive, but at the same time, what would be your likely diagnosis here? Yeah, this would be achalasia, and what is the histopathology related to achalasia? Achalasia is going to be related to a loss of the myenteric plexus. Remember, esophageal cancer, mass lesion, presents as progressive dysphagia, whereas sin dysphagia, if you so call it, is going to be related to achalasia. Remember the myenteric plexus that is lost in achalasia, what is the normal function of the myenteric plexus? It is going to be the innervation of the inner circular and outer longitudinal muscle. So, key things for achalasia for you to know. It is a bird's beak appearance on your swallow study. You get high lower esophageal sphincter on manometry. And that's really important for you to know because the lower esophageal sphincter, here we go, fails to relax in achalasia. However, in GERD, it relaxes too much. Everybody understand that? Fails to relax in achalasia, but it relaxes too much in GERD. You can relate achalasia to Chagas disease. And remember, in our heart pathology, we talked about Chagas disease causing even uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. So, a key quick fire of squamous versus adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, okay? Here we go. plumber vincent syndrome. plumber vincent syndrome causes you to have a squamous risk factor because of the esophageal webs, you can get squamous esophageal cancer. What is plumber vincent syndrome? It's going to be a triad of dysphagia, glossitis, and iron deficiency anemia, and the dysphagia is going to be related to esophageal webs. What about achalasia? Does it give you a squamous or adenocarcinoma of the esophagus? Achalasia is going to be squamous, right? Anytime you think of squamous carcinomas of the esophagus, think about chronic irritation. I'm irritating the web. I'm irritating that lower esophageal sphincter because it fails to relax. What about obesity? Ooh, obesity. What is that going to cause? More adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. And that's related to especially like Barrett's esophagus due to long-standing GERD turning into adenocarcinoma. GERD, what did we talk about? Adenocarcinoma, exactly. How about this one? Iranian or Japanese. Iranian or Japanese drinking the hot tea. That's going to be irritation and that's going to be related to squamous. Exactly, very good. What about smoking? Smoking is going to be squamous and adenocarcinoma. Smoking is going to cause both, whereas alcohol is particularly going to be squamous. So this is a good buzzword as to what, what kind of pathologies are related um, uh, to esophageal cancer.